I'm going to uh, talk about robotics um, and uh, some tire track stories about robotics. I think uh, unlike uh, Peter was talking about IT being 10 to 15 years, robotics is more like 20 to 30 years for the same sort of change from fundamental breakthrough to, to uh, economic uh, production. Um, and once we get my title up there, you'll see that it says Robotics, Automation, and the Future of Transportation. I did not come up with that title, but since I'm talking about the future of transportation, apparently I will, Peter. Um, I'm going to give three stories. Um, uh, Peter asked me uh, j just earlier this week to, to give some tire track type stories. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's a great commonality with all the stories we've seen before. I'm going to start with uh, mobile robots. These were the th world's mobile robots in 1977. And the significance of 1977 is when that's when I came to the US to go to grad school uh, at, at Stanford. And I chose Stanford because Stanford had a mobile robot. Um, there was one in France, and there was one in uh, JPL. Um, the, the one at JPL was really teleop. The other two people were trying to make them autonomous. I didn't actually work on the mobile robot myself, but I became Hans Moravec's um, uh, gopher as he was working on it. And 1977, um, he had to, uh, this was funded by NASA. It was uh, to, you know, early, early work on, on getting a, a rover to, to go on a planetary surface. But in 1977, you had to either invent or implement everything. So for his, this, this was a picture he put for one of his reports to NASA. Well, he had to figure out how to do computer graphics, and there were a few papers around, and then he had to write a computer graphics program in order to make a, a, a diagram. <coughs> he also had to invent image pyramids, stereo vision, building maps, navigating simultaneously to render an image uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a Xerox graphics printer was a hard task then. But there you see an image and some data that he was getting from his stereo vision. And he found this very difficult problem that you'd take some data where positions were, and then the robot would move, and you'd take some more data. And then you had to correlate the data between the, the things from unknown different coordinate systems. So you're trying to build a map up from multiple observations as you're moving with uncertainty in the world and not knowing the, the relation between those, those uh, observations. By the way, he also had to build a digital radio link, um, overlay graphics, and all sorts of other stuff. And he had to do path planning. And this robot, there's the mainframe, when everyone was asleep between midnight and 6 AM, he was on a good night. Uh, I'd, I'd help him set things up. He was able to get about uh, 20 yards in six hours uh, moving across this space. I went to MIT and, and uh, started to work on this problem myself, built a robot from scratch. And in 1985, um, two of us, Roger Chetillo and Jean-Paul Lamont, two groups, one from France, one from the US, published the same idea at the, at the same conference. And that was something called um, um, uh, loop closing, that when you move around and you make many observations and you keep moving and you see the same place from somewhere else, you can propagate backwards the errors and tighten up your observations. That turned out to be a key observation for what became simultaneous localization and mapping, SLAM. Um, but, but the two of us had terrible, terrible model, statistical models. I claim my model was worse than theirs. Um, it was really bad. The next year, Peter Cheeseman at NASA came up with a better model. And by 1991, Hugh um, uh, uh, Durant White at Oxford, along with John Leonard, who's now at MIT, came up with a CRISP model. But Peter, one of the things you asked about is where do these people come from? Hugh Durant White did his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania with Rosina Baichi and Lou Paul. And so he was federally funded too, thinking about this problem back then. And then something happened where there were lots and lots of um, low-cost mobile platforms made available. And instead of just a handful of people working on these problems, suddenly there were hundreds of people working on the problems. And by the mid-90s to the late 90s, the conferences on, on uh, robotics were all about this problem of SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. And people started, uh, the, the red there is the uh, without loop closing, the observations, and then you uh, do the loop closing, you tighten it up, and you get the Cartesian map. And so lots and lots of papers publishing maps of computer science buildings around the country 
Um, we made it hard at MIT with the Stata Center because it's not rectilinear. Their results always looked worse than everyone else's. Um, but that hardware availability led the crowds of researchers got to well-defined scientific problems that lots and lots of people could work on, and it came to solutions. And then DARPA got back into the picture. DARPA got back into the picture. How do we now make this practical? And with the DARPA challenge and then the DARPA, what was it, what was it? DARPA Grand Challenge and then the DARPA Urban Challenge, a series of, of challenges where people tried to take this technology out of the labs, SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, put it onto real vehicles on real roads with real traffic, which through Sebastian Thrun from CMU then led to the Google cars. And now these technologies are starting to be in high-end automobiles. That's a 2014 S-Class Mercedes, has lots and lots of safety features, not, not completely autonomous driving, but a lot of safety. Some of this is it's sort of based around the SLAM ideas, extended out with other ideas. So there's a long history from really late 70s to now uh, of an idea which wasn't about self-driving cars when it started. It was about navigation on other planets. Um, and uh, you know there was some, work from, some funding from ONR, but DARPA and NASA were, were, were big in it. In the middle, when it got out into lots and lots of univers universities, then NSF came in and was a heavy funder of this. They were not in the, in the early days. But when it became a well-defined problem, that was where lots and lots of universities, lots and lots of people, all making little contributions, came in. Later, it's become private governments and uh, other private companies and other governments. Singapore government, for instance, is, is, is really trying to deploy self-driving vehicles at the end of some train lines in, in Singapore right now. Daniela Rus from MIT is very involved with that. But um, there's two problems still that are out there. This is, since it said future of transportation, this is the future of transportation part. Um, how do drivers interface with robotic cars? So you've got this robotic car that you're in, and something really bad happens. How do you bring back a person's attention to the, to the problem and get the person involved? That's a serious problem. But there's, I think there's a more serious problem that people haven't been looking at. And that is the social acceptance of uh, these robotic cars. How do people outside the cars interface with them? So, um, so Peter, you're on a, 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 a little country road, walking on a little country road in the dark at, ni you know, at night, and you hear a car coming, and it's a really narrow little road. You're walking in the middle of it. The car comes. What do you do? Jump out of the way. You jump out of the way because you will have no clue whether the driver of that car is going to see you or not. If it's, if it's um, uh, daytime, Central Square in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you step out onto the road on the marked pedestrian crossing, you don't know whether that car is going to see you or not either. But you look at the driver. And you see if they've got their cell phone up and their head away, yep. or they're determinedly down like this. And you have some social interaction with that driver, some social understanding of what the driver's intent is. So imagine that Nissan is correct, and we are going to have self-driving cars soon deployed. I think if, if, you, if there's no interaction, no understanding from people of what the car's intent is, it'll be, everything will be like that country road uh, at night. If you don't know what it's going to do, the cars become the first class citizens, the people become the second class citizens, and I think that's going to lead to problems. So I think the adoption of self-driving cars beyond the technology is going to be a complex interplay of social and irrational along with better user interaction. And just as an example, the, when BART was built in, in the Bay Area, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, it was originally going to be self-driving trains. But that was socially unacceptable. Um, here in Washington, the, uh, the red line was running under, what's it called? ATO, automatic train operation, with a person in the cabin, but the computers driving the, the trains, until 2009, when there was a non-redundant communication system and there was an accident which killed a few people. And it's only in the last few months that the red line trains have gone back to starting to go back to ATO, automatic train operation, which is much more efficient because the trains stop exactly where they're supposed to stop. But 
Just a few deaths, and I say just a few deaths, completely change people's acceptability of self-driving trains. We are seeing self-driving trains happen without, it, without people at all in a few places, but it came about because first we had them in very constrained situations in airports where you had no choice of going on a self-driving train or not. You didn't realize it was self-driving. And only slowly over time has that extended so that now the Toulouse um, subway system is totally self-driving without human operators at all in the trains and one of the metro lines in Paris. But imagine as we get self-driving cars, um, Randy, suppose uh, self-driving cars kill 10 people in a year. What, what's the reaction to that going to be in the US? Uh, that's not good, even though there'll be 50,000 people killed by... Yeah, it's around 35,000 people per year now. It used to be 50,000 are killed by human drivers. But the, the, the outrage about five people being killed, which is not a good thing, I agree, but it's not all going to be about ration, rational cost-benefit analysis. Having the self-driving cars may save a lot more lives that human drivers would have, would have uh, uh, caused to be lost. So I think it's a complex situation. And this is the research now is not the technical research. The research is, uh, uh, is social research. And it's got to be these companies which figure out the adoption uh, and the adoption models. Second example I want to talk about. Second tire tracks, behavior-based robotics. This was something I'd, I'd gotten, because my statistical models were so bad for mapping, I, I decided to give up on them and started looking at um, uh, models uh, of robotics based on insects, spiders, and birds, simple behaviors that didn't have uh, very complex models, and started uh, a, a different approach to robotics, um, which took a while to get going. Um, I, at this time, we still had a little block funding from DARPA. Some of us remember the block funding days. And under block funding, you could do weird stuff without, without uh, having to justify it too much. And that was really good uh, for us. So based on these insects, um, I built robots and uh, uh, got funding from NASA for very small uh, uh, rovers, very small um, planetary explorers. Um, this is a paper with Anita Flynn that I published in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. People ask me why did I publish in that journal. I just wanted to have Journal of British Interplanetary Society on my CV for the rest of my life. Um, uh, um, but uh, we, we worked with, with, with NASA. We built a, a little tiny, um, this is a, a, a Colin Angle, uh, summer of 89, built a little tiny rover out at JPL that turned into their Rocky program. Very, very highly funded, as you can see. For those of you who recognize that, that's a uh, old Macintosh case for the robot body. It was a real little, little, little tiny project on the side that Donna Shirley at JPL kept going with a little trickle of money. Um, meanwhile, Colin, Helen Grainer, and I started iRobot. I'm the young guy on the left there. Um, and uh, we started iRobot as a space exploration company. Uh, we were going to go. Uh, to the moon and Mars. Um, we did a lot of stuff. We tied up with BMDO, Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, another government sponsor, and put a robot in one of their brilliant pebbles. It was going to go with Clementine to the moon. Um, uh, we did test launches with it on Earth. And then NASA got wind of it and said, oh, oh, you can't do that. But we've got this little project out at JPL the uh, rovers that we had started there. And so we did, that's how we got rovers on Mars, not directly via the company that I started, but via the project that we'd started out at JPL. At iRobot, we went on. We started getting company funding. So this is corporate funding from Johnson & Wax to build a cleaning robot, which didn't get deployed ultimately. And we got more DARPA funding to build robots um, f to uh, 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 go out and, and, and inspect areas was the original uh, uh, idea of them. But then in 2002, those robots got deployed to Afghanistan and then Iraq, and 4,500 of them were used for IEDs in, in those two wars. So, and another 4,500 robots from another small robot company in, in Massachusetts, uh, uh, Foster Miller, which bought, got bought by Kinetic. So about 9,000 robots in all 
deployed in, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan to do improvised explosive device disposal. And at the same time, after 14 failed business models, which I have a list of somewhere else, we got two working business models in 2002, the Roomba home robot cleaning, which came from the behavior-based stuff and did come from that corporate funding from Johnson Wax. The PackBots were in Iraq, Afghanistan. The Roombas brought you this, the YouTube videos of cats on, on the, but there's about 14, I believe 14 million of those deployed now. Uh, iRobot's making two million Roombas per year. So behavior-based robotics, early on it was DARPA, NASA, and ONR. ONR was uh, really interested in, in the biological emulation aspect. Uh, in the middle it was DARPA, Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, NASA, and MITI in Japan. Now here's an interesting story about how hard it is to tell when something's going to become practical. MITI, you might remember, was the big, the big thing that Japan had that was funding its, its uh, corporate research. The US was upset with the unfair advantage that was giving to uh, Japanese companies. So MITI said, OK, we'll fund US companies too. And the very first company they funded was mine, iRobot, at the time called IS Robotics. And we had six employees. And we were funded to do nuclear power plant robots. And we did it for about three years. And then MITI said, eh, you don't really need robots in nuclear power plants. Um, and that was the state until, you might remember, March 11, 2011, when Fukushima happened. On March 18th, 2011, the Japanese government called up iRobot and said, could you send some robots? Which we did. I was still on the board within 48 hours. The robots are still there. I was in um, uh, uh, Fukushima uh, last April um, as part of the uh, Obama Abe summit that was on and uh, with Gil Pratt. Um, and uh, so back in the mid 90s, the Japanese government said, ah, they're not really needed. 20 years later, they realized they were needed. And the Japanese robots could not go in there because they were not battle hardened in the way that the iRobot robots were having been deployed in real situations for 10 years. Later, behavior based robotics, DARPA, private companies, full deployment, rapid equipping force, and then VC funding to get that out there. Third thing I'm going to show. It's humanoid robots. This is one of the early humanoid robots. While iRobot was going on, I changed my research at MIT to start building humanoids. This is Cynthia Brazil, who's on the Media Lab faculty now, working with one of the early robots. Um, we had robots interacting with people, giving social cues to people, understanding social cues from people. Um, and uh, not very practical at the time. This is what a typical. Uh, robot installation has looked like in factories up to now, you notice there are no people there because the robots are too dangerous. So factories partitioned into all robots, no people. You go into an automotive factory, the body shop, all robots, no people, not even lights on because they don't need the lights and just sparks flying from the spot welding. You go into the final assembly, it's all people, no robots because you can't mix the two. So, and then to get the robots installed, you have to have these beautiful user interfaces over there on the left, um, lots of control boxes. Sensing comes separate. You have to cage them. And so what we did, uh, Matt Williamson, uh, particularly in that uh, system developed under NASA funding, series elastic actuators, is start to put robots in factories with people and humanoid robots, which have social interactions with people. They, as he was showing in that video from the 90s, they show the robot what they want it to do by grabbing it and moving it around. It learns the task, not the coordinates. And um, an ordinary factory worker who has no training is able to program these robots. Whereas traditional robots, um, there's about 3,000 people in the world who can program them. They have to understand quaternions, six-dimensional vectors. It's a very, very complex task. And so here's some of those robots. Um, this is a, this is a, a, a kit. You know that plastic? Uh, plastic furniture you have in your basement that no one gets to see. It's the real cheap stuff that you put together yourself. This is kidding, that sort of plastic furniture. This is a steel case, actually. Um, uh, picking up sheet metal, 
doesn't have to be highly aligned because it uses force feedback as it puts it in a press brake, and then the press brake is bending these pieces of metal. These become shell, uh, you know, drawers in, in the office furniture. The guy uh, in the far part there is doing the same job. Those guys often don't have fingers that have been cut off in the press brake. That particular uh, 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 place is uh, 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. It's not a very pleasant work environment. His, um, this is Harley Davidson gearbox gears in a, fact, in a factory making Harley Davidson gearboxes. Um, these, all these uh, tasks that I'm showing you now are very simple tasks. We were not involved in the deployment of the robots at all. It was the factory workers or the uh, line engineer. This, this particular case, um, the, uh, there's a, 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 a cross beam. The parts are moving forward till they break the cross beam, but then it's using vision in the cameras uh, to uh, locate the part and go pick up the parts. Uh, and uh, I think uh, with that, I'll take questions. Oh, oh, oh let, yeah, I want, I want just a few more of these, these going just to show you some examples. Um, these are all um, American factories. People in the factories have gotten these robots to do these really dull, boring tasks. And the humanoid robots early on DARPA and NASA, middle DARPA and NASA, and later VC funding. Uh, but that, that was really started in 1991, so it's still 24 years and we're not cash flow positive yet. So 